So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nils. Uh, I work as a, as the CTO at Enteros uh, Integration in Sweden. I'm joined today by our friend at HiveMQ. We have many friends there, but <coughs> one is joining us today. Oh. Yeah. Hi. I'm Günther. I'm a yeah, solution engineer at, at HiveMQ, and I'm pleased to be here with Nils together in that webinar. And thanks for inviting us and me personally to that in to that webinar. So today we're going to talk a bit about event-driven architecture and mostly how to deal with it when you have a large deployment of IoT devices. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the, the background of uh, one of the most popular protocols that is used. Um, we're also going to talk a bit about HiveMQ, that's why Ginter is here and a bit about how Enteros uh, as a company and with the help of our products deal with this kind of challenges uh, for our clients. So just to start off, um, as I'm sure everyone in this room, even though it's virtual, um, knows digital transformation is happening. It's happening fast. Um, and nowadays, it's not only about connecting systems, connecting servers and applications. You actually need to connect and talk between moving devices, smaller devices, um, devices that are supposed to and expected to be connected at all times. And that's where the whole IoT part comes in. We think this is a very interesting challenge. Um, it's a interesting space to work in and there's a lot of challenges to overcome there's also a lot to do to be successful um, so that's what we're gonna give some tips and tricks about today and share share our stories and knowledge just a quick introduction to Enteros as a company um, we've been in business for 11 years now we have roughly 45 people working with integration uh, around Sweden. And we are very, very specialized when it comes to system integration. That's what we do, that's what we know, and that's what we love. Um, we do a lot of different things within system integration though, where we do uh, strategy. We help our customers uh, around the world, mostly in Sweden to be successful working with integrating all their different systems. Um, we obviously also develop integrations. Um, then we also have support and operations for what we deliver. And quite recently, we also started with our own academy where we have an education, we have a certification on how to build integrations the Enteros way, which we think is the best way. Um, so that's short about us. Um, Starlify that you see in the bottom there is a new product from us that I'm going to talk more about briefly towards the end of this talk. And as I alluded to before, we are more and more moving from a centralized way of working where one big system in the middle is trying to talk to um, systems outside of its scope towards where we are now and where we're moving in uh, the, the direction of is a more distributed system or distributed landscape where you you don't necessarily know where and how your uh, integrated parts are acting. Um, so that's a new challenge uh, for many. Uh, and yeah, that gives you a bit of background why this is a big focus for us, why we think it's important to, to get better when it comes to the distributed type of integrations. And one way of tackling those kind of challenges is um, using a platform or a broker like HiveMQ and the MQTT protocol. So I'm gonna leave it over to Ginter to share a bit more about your, your recipe for success. And uh, I'll continue giving, sharing more of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks Nils. So um, 
uh, as you said, right, the question is, why is MQTT the best choice to for doing these event-driven architectures and, and um, that on large scale? Just a brief history of MQTT because very often MQTT is perceived as something new and it's really there for a while. So as you can see, it's more than 20 years uh, in, intentionally or originally uh, created for monitoring oil pipelines with the vision that these are kind of distributed uh, all over the world, basically in remote locations with with uh, maybe not good saturated uh, network and all of that. <clears throat> but it evolved over time to a really industry standard for communication across um, for, for all sorts of devices. Um, it's also a synonym for the IoT space. Um, very often IoT and MQT comes along, we'll see why this is. One of the main steps for um, MQTT be, to be successful was basically um, the, the release of uh, version 3.1 in 2010. So over the last uh, uh, yes, 13 years now, um, it has evolved into various versions, 3.1.1 and just uh, 2018. Again, a major step in defining a new standard MQTT 5 with a lot of more um, additional capabilities, which makes it very attractive uh, for various use cases um, along the way. Um, and um, if you look into the, the typical behavior of MQTT, um, if you just um, click one further, Niels. So um, why is MQTT so popular? We will see in a, in a minute, but this, this graph here actually outlines the importance of MQTT in the last five to eight years, right? So so it really gained momentum with all the different um, uh, projects along with energy management, with um, remote uh, assets, connected assets, connected cars, and also found its way into manufacturing use cases. So MQTT is nowadays the de facto standard for IoT, uh, which is here proven by uh, a simple Google Analytics um, uh, search. So. Um, comparing the most prominent uh, candidates for for this kind of activity, and clearly it, it outlines how how the the MQTT evolution goes still on, right? It's still on rising. It's still used more and more. But why is that? If you if you um, think about the um, the advantages that MQTT brings, you can basically name some of them as it is really a push and uh, publish and, and subscribe pattern, which I will explain in a minute because it's one of the most fundamental changes in, in how we, we connect things. It's actually also made for environments where you have unreliable network uh, and un unreliable um, yeah, network connections, but still need to have reliable uh, communication, meaning no data loss can occur. It can also use due to its low overhead in constrained devices with maybe low bandwidth uh, or, or with um, high latency environments, also very condensed um, uh, um, resources, like there is, they're running on battery, uh, CPU memory is, is very low. So this is also made for MQTT, but in the end, it's really always there if you need to have something collecting a lot of information from a lot of clients and focusing that into an integration part. So where is MQTT used? So MQTT use is basically used in a lot of different use cases. So for instance, what, what I already said a bit, connected cars, almost all these connected car platforms are actually using MQTT to communicate between the car and central applications. All the different vendors are actually providing to, to their end customers. IoT 4.0 has a lot of, of traction for MQTT as well, as well as logistics transportations, which are kind of a, um, similar to connected cars, but with a different uh, data consumption and, and, and um, uh, the, the, the base idea of what they do with the data. But in general, it can be any IoTs or Internet of Things platform where you have some sort of asset transferring data um, to a central instance of, of data consumption, but also to receive messages back. And that also leads into communication use cases. So as promised, I would like to go a little bit more into why this is and also remove some of the kind of misperception we have seen in the market. So MQT has been, sometimes is, is 
just seen as as a protocol where you send a message and maybe or maybe not it will be consumed or it will be transported over but that's not true because mqtt really defines different services of level uh, so, uh, quality of service levels which makes sure that your data is either really just send and fire and forgot uh, as we may sometimes call it as QS0, but there are mechanisms in place which ensure that both parties in a communication can be sure that the data has really transfer, uh, trans transported over from the client into a broker, in this case, HiveMQ. So this is, this is number one, um, let's say misperception we see, and I just wanted to outline that. But the main paradigm change we already um, I already talked about is the pub sub model. So publish and subscribe, and why this is so important. So if you think about where data is produced and where data is consumed um, in the pub sub model, the client or they say in, on the left hand side temperature sensor sensor just says I have information to share, maybe the temperature. And somebody says, I would like to know the temperature of this location, all locations. And it basically just subscribes to that and gets the data alongside many others which may uh, consume that data. And this seems to be trivial, but if, if, if you look into a traditional way of getting data from clients, we, we have a typical um, request and response pattern. <clears throat> we basically see in, a, in the next slide, Niels, That, that typically the, the approach was very often, I have a demand for data and I will get the data from the involved clients. So if you have another use case, another data consumption, another server which needs the same data, you basically do the same thing twice, right? You, you ask the client to either get the data or maybe you need to configure the client to, to send that data to that specific recipient. And that actually is, is something which is hard to maintain. It's, it's, it's a lot of effort to, to build that network and also to maintain it. And it's actually not built for, for flexibility. While the publish subscribe model we, we just um, uh, see in a minute or in the next slide is basically indicating that if you are sending that data central point, everybody interested in data can immediately use it. So the client doesn't need to know where the data is consumed and if it actually is consumed, which opens that for a lot of uh, new, new um, use cases. It's, it's easy and flexible um, to use. It's actually also very scalable because you, you don't have that, that many to many connectivity to maintain. And it's basically built for just reporting an update on change. Also a different pattern than polling for, for values without any information if it has changed or not. So in summary, what it really delivers using MQTT in such event-driven architectures is that you are driving your innovation much faster, right? You have a much faster time to market with your new services, with additional services you can apply on already collected data. You have a very efficient resource and energy usage, um, which is, again, from my point of view, an erasing topic again, um, especially the energy part. And it's so flexible in design that you can apply that concept to almost all use cases you have there. And as we will see in a minute, um, I'm pretty sure Niels has a good example for that. It actually um, supports the largest deployments um, from, from its core co-intention. So I hopefully I, uh, I have hit you on the right feet, uh, Niels. I believe you have a good example for using MQTT in the real world. Yeah, I just happened to have one. That's a... That's shocking. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, we, we had the pleasure of working with uh, Keolis in Sweden um, in a project just like this. Um, and Keolis for, is, uh, for, for the people that haven't heard that before, I, I know they were, it was news to me when we started working with them. It's a French company with subsidiaries around the world. They are responsible for uh, managing and driving a lot of the buses in Stockholm, mostly, um, or at least that's where we were involved. Um, they were tasked with quite a big challenge uh, based on new standards being set in the world of transportation. 
which is where these kind of challenges are popping up more and more. Um, they have a big ecosystem with clients. Um, they have a lot of vendors uh, supplying them with different software and different services. Um, they also, with this, uh, what I'm going to talk more about now, they have a big challenge when it comes to how do we manage all this data on our buses. And what they needed to do was basically take 100 real-time flows of data, sending that end-to-end -end from every single bus that's driving, um, which is roughly a few hundred, um, to their end, yeah, the, the target system, which can be anywhere in Sweden. In this case, it happened to be the, the transport institution in, in Sweden. Um, that want to know where the buses are, how their buses are feeling, uh, what's the oil temperature, what's the level of, of gas in the car, is the door open, um, is the door closed, all information like that. So it's approximately 30 different metrics being gathered from each bus. Um, and it has to be sent every second, and it can only take two seconds to arrive at its destination. And just as a side note to, to give you some perspective on um, this challenge, um, it would probably not have been possible before 4G because all of the buses need to be connected and the technology we had before 4G and now we have 5G as well is not fast enough and uh, the latency. So we, ha we have 4G to thank for, for a lot of these uh, innovations and these new solutions being possible. Um, but what we noticed is that um, MQTT as a protocol is very good to use when it comes to these, these small messages, but they need to, they are being sent from a very resource constrained entity, which is the bus in this case. And there are many of them. Uh, and also it's very important to point out that this they are not really allowed to fail. If the information doesn't come from a bus for a while, that is that means that it's it gets pretty much impossible to show um, the data on the screens that are at the bus stops, showing you, oh, this bus will arrive in four minutes. All this data is what sets what makes that possible. And just as a uh, some interesting numbers here um, to highlight the scale of this. Um, so the, the traffic in Stockholm, bus traffic, there's approximately 265 million trips being made yearly. Um, and to support this solution or support that service that, that we have as, uh, as citizens, we are sending 18 billion events roughly every year from the buses to the central hub. Uh, I think that's quite crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of messages uh, supporting everything that, that we take for granted uh, to see where our bus is, to know if there are delays. Yeah. And also, of course, gives the QLIS in this case, great opportunities to make their routes better, to plan better how much fuel do we need in the bus when we start this route because so the data that they get is very very valuable for improving what they deliver uh, as a service just to show you an overview of the how the events are being sent and the architecture here mqtt as you can see is a, a broker in the middle here where the vehicles all vehicles send everything to, sorry, I was supposed to say Hive, HiveMQ. HiveMQ is the MQTT broker being used in the middle here, um, managing all the different messages, events coming from, from all the buses. It then gets transferred through a bridge to, to Kafka. Um, this is something, if anyone wants to know more about this solution, I'm happy to talk about it at a later stage. Um, but this gives you a brief overview of how, how messages are flowing. So let's see. 
this is a teaser for how it can look when we visualize these kind of solutions, which is what I will talk more about later after, after Ginter tells us more about why you should choose HiveMQ. Um, and also before I let you do that, Ginter, I just I forgot to mention before we started that if you have any questions during during the talk now, please use the QA functionality in Zoom. There's a bottom in, uh, button in the bottom where you can click Q&A and you can write your questions. And <clears throat> we'll try to answer them in the end. Otherwise, we'll get back to you uh, separately afterwards. Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks, Niels. Um, I think you, you really pretty uh, nicely outlined the importance of uh, a reliable uh, system. And the question I, I raise to myself um, Basically, every day is why Hive and Q, right? What what makes us the the number one choice for such projects using MQTT in a in such environments? So we have something a little bit in common with Enteros. So we are basically found in the same area. So we are here for uh, eleven years as well. Um, we are located in uh, mainly located in Landshut, out of Munich. Um, but what what's really important about that slide is that. HiveMQ basically helps to move data to and from connected devices in efficient, fast, and reliable manner. Why do we believe that this is something we need to fulfill? So when our company was founded uh, almost 10, 11 years now um, uh, back, we have actually worked in, in a consulting area around IoT concepts, IoT um, projects, and we really found that there was a lack of, of solutions on the market which can, can fulfill um, a, specific, so, a sort of a, a list of, of things which we believe that a, a broker, an MQT broker needs to do. So our company founders decided to go into delivering that, that solution by not only writing a software, but also by contributing to the community. So if, if one of you um, Googles for MQTT, very often you find content from HiveMQ um, related to trainings and, and basically um, startup helps to say, okay, how, what, how can you use MQTT? And so we are very active in the community, but we also try forward these standards by working within the Oasis um, open um, community, for instance. We also take care about other surrounding topics like Spark, Black, um, IoT in general, and there are even more um, standardization agreements we actually work in with to, to really drive not only the, the, our software sales, but also the community forward. Yeah, so what were the, what was the points we, we found uh, in the early days that an, a broker, which is used in an environment like the QLIS example, what does it need to fulfill and what's probably not, not there on the market? So first of all, certainly scale is, is, a, is a really growing um, demand. So um, we have environments where you have more and more, we talk about thousands and millions of devices connected to a central platform, and you still need to kind of grow with the demand of customers. We just recently um, had a webinar on our own um, showing that 200 million connected um, uh, assets can communicate through a single broker, um, which outlines that scale is something which, which is possible. However, scale only makes sense if you not only be able to to handle the, the messages going back and forth, but you need to do it in a way that it's reliable and secure for your, for your use cases. Security is a very um, important topic in these exposed environments, like buses, like they can stand somewhere un, un, unattended. Um, all, all parts of that bus need to be secure. They need to communicate secure and so on. But really the main focus, and Neil said that, right? What is the, re, what is the, the, the reason uh, or what is the, the value of being reliable. If you think about you're on, in Stockholm at the bus stop and you want to know if the bus just left or you have to wait 15 minutes for the next bus to come and there would be a blank um, uh, display saying, I have no clue where the bus is, right? You cannot, as an, as an organization operating that, that system, you cannot afford to lose messages, which would basically indicate the right status to your customers at that point. So not losing that message is one of our key core values saying, 
we are an always on um, system um, and support that in a high available way, even throughout operational tasks we will we will see in a, in a minute. Uh, certainly, hopefully, a broker typically tends to be part of the architecture, as Niels already said in, in the overall um, um, show how events flow, right? So there are kind of the devices, there are kind of the backends, but still the broker is somewhere in the middle and hopefully you will never recognize it, right? It's, it's running there, it's doing its work, and this is the best indication, but still you may need to have the need to look into it and see a little bit on what the, what the broker is handling, what is the load, there are some details about clients and so on. And all of these parts are really, really important, especially, and that's where, where Interius is basically leverage our, our platform as well, to integrate that collected data into a better, into an overall system, which helps the customer finally to fulfill their goals. <clears throat> so um, how does a, a typical um, uh, environment look like? So um, if you just click one further. Yeah, so if we talk about high available, just some things to mention, what is important about high ability and scalability? So as I already said, the, the highest good on a, on a broker is that you don't lose messages. So you need to be capable of doing kind of the local persistence of messages in flight without the risk of losing them. For instance, if you have really an outage, could be on the location you host, could be on, on, on the technology, on the infrastructure, could be even the software, right? So you need to survive these situations without a message loss. And we do it in a clusterless, um, um, a masterless cluster architecture. That means that we don't have a single point of failure in, within our architecture, which would actually contradict to that paradigm of not losing um, functionality. That also enables operational um, uh, tasks to be done on production, on, on a running system, like updating the software. Even HiveMQ has some updates. Actually, we ship an update every month. You can do use that. You can easily apply that without interrupting your service. You, you have to provide against the clients and the services connecting to it. Um, it, go, um, it also uses that for configuration changes. You can actually apply your, your own settings at any time. OK. And as already this, um, said, one of the main things we see in, in such projects is, again, the side of producing information is typically some sort of device, some sort of, of asset, which could be a bus, right? It could be uh, sensors, it could be an, an energy um, metric sensor, it could be a car, a bus, it could be a manufacturing device, whatever it is, they typically send data into a central point like our hyphen Q broker in a, in a real huge manner, right? So every device on its own has just a few messages sent, but in some day they, they end up on, on, on contributing to, a, as we have already heard, billions of messages per year. And I, if I do my calculations right, that's more than a million messages per day, right? And you need to handle those messages with all the connected assets um, on scale. So that's why we always run in a clustered way. Um, sorry, can you go? Please back one just for, for a minute. So this, this needs to, to, to run in a real uh, available uh, manner. And one of the main points of using that data is really on integrating that into the facility, into the systems the customer has or needs to have, right? And this is again where our open extension system comes in play. So we are an open system. We allow our customers to actually use our system to their specific needs in, in, uh, in the way that we also allow extensions to be created within um, an HypenQ broker, which are fully supported and fully certified uh, by our organization. So we treat our customers in a way that we want to have them as a solution user and not on a software uh, buyer, right? So they, they do their own extensions, they can create their own extensions, we certify that and we support them for our broker, for the extension, and basically for the whole overall system they, they use. And again, integrating into HiveMQ is something um, uh, Interius actually leverage to fulfill their need as well. Mm -hmm. And I think Niels will show us how that actually works and how that can look like in, in that I mentioned scenario we, we have heard in, in uh, for Keolis. Oh, yeah, my summary slide, sorry, I forgot about that. I just want to reiterate, it is important that you, you, you 
you know, check your requirements and see, is it really a secure environment? HyphenQ is built to support you in all of these mission critical applications with our described high available system architecture, the operational reliability, and very important, the in-flight data retention without any message loss whatsoever, right? Um, failures and, and uh, operational downtimes need to be survived and need to be maintained as nothing would have had has happened. Thank you, Ginter. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great summary of, yeah, now I'm sold. I'm sold on HiveMQ. Um, let's see then, just to, to wrap this up a bit, um, we have discussed um, the challenges which is clear to most people, I think. We have discussed at least one protocol that you can use or leverage together with, with a broker uh, to solve at least part of this uh, equation. As Ginter said, what, and what we have seen with many customers as well is that, yeah, Hive, HiveMQ or MQTT broker in general is one usually big part of the puzzle when it comes to these kind of solutions, but you need to make sure that you put everything together in a good way because there are more and more devices involved there's more and more people involved from different organizations and what we have found is that visualizing this scope and setting the guidelines from the start for how you want to tackle this is is the way to go it can speed things up um, and that's why one of the reasons why we uh, started building uh, Starlify, which is which our our product for visualizing and working with these kind of um, projects. Not only these kind of projects, but integration in general. Um, we think that having something visualized that you can collaborate um, towards makes it easier to share and understand, uh, especially when you come into scenarios where it's such a big and complex environment and the landscape of devices are yeah huge um, so what we have found from from leveraging that and where we have all of this is uh, documented the whole landscape of Keolis in this case uh, is documented this way and visualized and we we noticed that it gives us a much better visibility into what's going on, or maybe more importantly, what will go on yeah, in the future. So that's one, and uh, you can do this without using Starlify, I just have to mention, but this is what we have learned and why we are doing it this way. It's, so, it's important to gain the visibility. It's also very, important to have an open uh, culture and work together on these kind of problems. Um, going back to the point both me and Ginter made, it's, that's one part of the problem. For example, the MQTT broker or uh, the Kafka bridge uh, or the people working to build integrations. We are all part of the puzzle. We need to work together and collaborate and get the information from the right person into the right place. Yeah. yeah, and what what we noticed when we work like that, uh, we minimize the, the gap of knowledge. We, we share it in one central place with one uh, set of guidelines. Not one person or one system is uh, working alone. And that's what we want to strive towards. And we find that you get a much smoother and faster delivery of your integrations. Um, I didn't really mention that, but uh, the project we did together with HiveMQ and Keolis um, was actually made in six months, which we found was a very big challenge when we started. And there were bumps and challenges, more even more challenges along the road, of course, but sticking to our met uh, methods, our guidelines, and the way of working, we we managed to to pull it off, and much thanks to the technology we used, but maybe even more so the way we are working and collaborating when it comes to building these sort of solutions. 
So I think that's a big takeaway. Um, we, yeah, I'm gonna wrap it up there. We so just to to summarize again, we we have we know now that there are many great technologies to to use when it comes to these kind of challenges. But maybe more importantly, we we need to work together and have one way of collaborating and getting towards that goal. So the technology is not very usable without the people working with it, right? Um, I'm gonna end on that note. Um, we have five minutes left now uh, on the allotted time. So if anyone has some questions, feel free to, to write it either to me or to Ginter. Um, or if you wanna tell us what you had for lunch, that's fine too. Um, but you can use the Q&A button in the, in the Zoom call here. So there's no questions asked during the talk. So I guess that means it was very clear. And we have the same number of attendees now as when we started. That's also a good. Um, I think, yeah. yeah, there's one question from Hans. Uh, can you see this again? Yes, we will. This is recorded. We will share this uh, session. This webinar with, will be shared with all of you joining. So if you want to refresh yourself or share it with someone you know, you will be able to. You'll, you'll get an email once it's ready. So if there's no other questions, um, I wish you a pleasant rest of your day. And I'm very grateful you all joined while having your lunch, at least most of you, I'm pretty sure was this was your lunch hour. That's flattering. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, thanks I, to Ginter. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond, Niels, uh, again, thanks for, for having us here. The pleasure uh, to do that webinar with you and hopefully more to come. And uh, again, thank you for all the attendees, attendees spending their, their lunchtime with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. And as I said, we'll, we'll be in touch when you're to follow up with any questions or let you know at least when, when this webinar is available for watching afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. You as well.